So we have a special promotion going on here in February. This is our diesel tablet. This was just launched last year. This is our mid-range diagnostic tool. It will do thousands of the most common diagnostic commands. So if you're working on your EGR system, you're trying to change engine parameters, you're trying to work on your SCR system, this will do the resets, the calibrations, the installs, all the things. You can one tap to repair information to get instant repair information for all your fault codes. It's a great, great tool to put inside your shop and it's priced very, very aggressively for the price point. And in February, we have a special promotion going on. So if you buy this tool in February and there's a limited amount, you will get five free online training courses. So these online training courses are not about the tool. These courses are about how to do electrical, how to troubleshoot after treatment systems, how to do all this advanced stuff that you need to know for today's commercial truck. So it's a $500 value, comes absolutely free with the product for the month of February. Check it out, 30 day money back guarantee. We know you're gonna love it. We sold a ton of these things already. Hey guys, welcome to Overhauled. This is Melissa Petersman. I am your host today. And today I have a guest on here today. His name is Schaefer. He has 30 years of experience and he is currently an automotive teacher. Schaefer, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? My name is Chris Schaefer. I am a diesel mechanic, 30 years, uh, very, in, very in experience from dealerships to fleets. Um, and now I currently am a teacher at Donaldson Career Center over by Greenville, South Carolina, teaching their new diesel program. What got you into the industry? I grew up on a farm up in Michigan. And uh, when it was come time to make a career choice, I started off uh, thinking I'll work on cars. But when I went to school up at Ferris State University, way up north in Michigan, I decided I uh, met some friends in the heavy equipment side and found that more interesting. So went that direction and Started working on trucks when I got out of there and just been doing it ever since. Love it. Did you work on then a majority of trucks pretty much your entire career then? A majority of trucks, tractor trailers, uh, varying sizes. Um, <clears throat> I did do a short stint at a, an equipment dealer working on John Deere, Komatsu, and and uh, equipment like that. Um, but I, it, my experience and comfort level has been with the trucks, so that's pretty much where I've stayed. And then, of course, I worked at Diesel Laptops for a couple of years, uh, their technical support division, helping people fix their stuff uh, remotely. And uh, and then I, and most of that was trucks as well, but a lot of equipment through that uh, program and very enjoyable. So that's actually something I wanted to dive into a little bit because Diesel Laptops does have a tech assistance program. Is it so with John Deere, we had, you know, obviously there's there's a DTAC, right, which is a dealer technical assistance. And that's with engineers at John Deere that help you. But most dealerships actually had an internal tech helpline too, um, like the Honda dealership I worked at had HETAC, which was Honda and technical assistance. And it what it was was, some um, you know, veteran mechanics usually and a group of their their pretty smart retired mechanics or mechanics didn't want to be in the industry anymore but still wanted to be a part of it and help people that they would all come together and when you would call for DTAC you had to go through them first as you know they would help you first through the technical assistance and run through the the diagrams with you if they needed to run through the procedures run through your tests then if they couldn't figure it out to get passed on to DTAC so how exactly does Diesel Laptop's version of that work? A customer calls with his um, issue um, and we take down some information and if we have an answer, we immediately give it to them. And if we don't, we'll do some digging. And what I would do is, but wow, you got, a, you got a good one there. And I would take some time, do some research and call them back. And with some more information that I was able to dig up through the internet or my various sources and plus what Diesel Laptop's had available. and call back with a repair plan. Uh, a lot of times I would call the customer back and say, hey man, how you doing on this? And can, do you need any more help? And just follow up on a lot of the cases and hopefully get them to a solution. Um, and then if uh, we ran out of answers, I'd call some old dealership friends and this, that, and the other and see what we could do for them. So you deal, your customers you, you're dealing with are probably, they're what, fleet mechanics? 
Uh, fleet mechanics and various, a uh, lot of road services out there that were on the road needing help. And uh, sometimes it was something as simple as a wiring diagram they needed pulled up, or sometimes it was, uh, man, I'm reading this information and I'm done everything and I'm still striking out. I've replaced this part after diagnosing. And so then you would come up with some, oh, different ideas for them. Just another second, second set of eyes, so to speak, yeah. to, uh, to help them walk through some of the hard problems. So, and uh, like I say, a lot of times there were some of them I would work on for a week with a person and go back and forth, lots of phone calls, digging up more information, come up with more ideas. Hey, try this or go buy this tool or this gauge and hook that to it and try this out. Just get them to the end, hopefully. A lot of good, a lot of good techs out there. But sometimes even the best tech that's working in a one-man show hits a rock and needs just needs a second opinion. Well, some of these machines are just complicated. You know, it's it, we had at one of the John Deere dealerships I worked at, we had a, a grader that was throwing everybody, including DTAC, for a loop. Because it was what it would do is you would go to try and run the smart grade right? The auto grade. And what it's supposed to do is it's got little sensors on it, right? And it's supposed to grade for you to make it easier. So I'm not going to like get way too technical into this. We spent like three months on this motherfucker, but what it, what it would do is you would go to drop it to cut the grade and it would sit there and do this and it would create washboards all the way down. And we messed with that grader for three or four months because like, and we had season text, D tag. It took forever to figure. I mean, we, I don't, I can't tell you how many goddamn calibrations I did on that motherfucker. How many smart grade calibrations I did on that. It was ridiculous. And what it ended up kind of turning out to be is the customer expected it to run like a, you know, the, these machines have, a basic form of smart grade on these machines stock where, you know, it has, you can set the level of it. You can set the grade of it. You can set the height of it and you can control one side. And then the other side will mirror what you do. Uh, you can also have an auto where you lower it down and it's supposed to just stay at one grade. It, it turned out to be a mixture of there was some issues with the controllers and there was some, or not controllers, but with the controls themselves. And there was some issues with that, but there, a lot of it was just the customer ha expected it to run like a Topcon ready machine and Topcon's like, you know, the air, like it's got the sensors on the blade. It's got the sensors on the front of the machine and the mass and all that stuff. And you got, it's got the, its own little monitor and it's satellite controlled. You know, this customer was expecting just a normal, smart grade version of that to be like Topcon ready machine. And yeah, I, I commend you guys for trying to fix stuff like that over the phone. Cause it's, Oh, or try, try and understand what a customer is trying to tell you on how a machine's running without actually being out there. None of us, none of us understood what he was trying to talk about unless until we went out there and we actually saw the washboard in his grade and we're like, Damn, that's that is bad. You were not over exaggerating. It was so bad the the poor operator was running it on manual mode because he couldn't use the auto grade. So yeah, sorry I went on like a total rant ramble there, but so I'm I'm sure you've heard of the shortage of diesel technicians in this industry. And I've talked to about eight people, eight or nine people now, and everybody seems to have a little bit different opinions on, you know, how we get people in. And, and you're, you said you teach, correct? So are you teaching high school kids or are you teaching? Yes. 10th through uh, seniors, 10th grade okay, through seniors. Right. So, how full are those classes? Because the, the automotive classes in high schools, especially has come up a lot in this podcast. 
So how full are your classes? Are you getting people into your classes? We're on our second year. Um, and uh, the first year program, the kids that did the, the, ma the mating year, we've got seven left over from it. So their second year kids are seven, but now the, uh, the, the first year this year, we got 16 in the class and I believe it's gonna grow. We've done a lot of tours. We've talked to, the, we got people going out and talking to the, getting them thinking about it at the junior high level, the middle school level. And uh, it looks like we're gonna have, uh, it's gonna stay full. It's designed for 18 kids per class. And um, we're hoping to have it filled up each year now. Uh, going forward after this year. Is it just a basic automotive class? Basically, ours is going to be uh, <clears throat> anything diesel, but we've also teamed up with a local co community college, uh, Greenville Tech, and uh, we're going to be doing college level classes and should be able to walk away with a degree or college uh, credits in, uh, let me see here, brakes, PMI, electrical, and that's the three and plus we're doing ASC training. So they should be fully certified in brakes and being able to do a PM and uh, hopefully have a good uh, handle on electrical. And that's where my focus is gonna be. And then we'll hit transmissions and everything else as well. But we're gonna hit the biggies that, that I think, even when I was a service manager several years ago that kid, we'd hire people and walk in and have to show them how to use an ohm meter. So <laughs> I'm hoping my kids are pretty proficient with it. They're gonna get yeah. tired of practicing that. So your your classes are strictly heavy duty then. Mine are strictly heavy duty. That's cool. Based on trucking, um, but we'll, we'll hit a little bit on equipment. But we have mostly truck equipment to work with, so that's what we're going to concentrate on, and hopefully make ASC certified truck mechanics when we when we're done. So we're getting ready to take our first break ASC test with my uh, second level second year students, and uh, hopefully they do well on it. You said you're teaming up with a college. So how many years does it take to earn all of these certifications through your course? Well, between my course, which would be two years in high school, and then the two years in, in the college if the, if the student proceeds, it'd be about four years total. So they don't have to, and I'm hoping to make it so they really don't have to go to college. Some people do not have any interest in it. So we're also uh, starting, well, we're not starting, we're doing some um, work-based learning. So the idea is going forward that we have 10th grade and 11th grade, and then their senior year, they do what's called work-based learning. And they they uh, go to high school in the morning, their, their base school, and then go to an employer in the afternoon and still receive high school credit. And they're working at the same time. So and that's what we're building some relationships to hopefully build that. Get, that, get them some hands-on training. And I think a lot of kids, a lot of these kids are so done with school. I don't know if I'll, probably half of them or less will go on to the college part. So we kind of want to make them work ready out of high school. A lot of, a lot of kids don't want to, they're done. They don't want to go to school much longer. They just want to get to work, buy their four-wheel drive truck and get on with life, you know? <laughs> That's how I was. That's how I was. I, I spent... I had two weeks of summer between my graduation and the day I started at WyoTech. And then I had school straight for one year. And, I, you know, obviously everybody knows WyoTech's a trade school. So there's no college classes associated with WyoTech. It's just, you know, mechanics. So it only took me a year to finish with extracurricular activities. Like, and I had an extra class on there. And I was also done with school at that point in time and I was so I was ready to work so it's I I feel blessed though of the high school experience I got to have when I was younger because we had automotive we had an automotive class and we had welding classes we had ag mechanics classes we had agriculture classes and a lot of these classes one form or another of this class was uh required to graduate and it one being which at least one semester of automotive and one being of which at least, or I think it was a year. And then the other one was, you know, at least a year of either woodworking or welding. And that, I, I feel pretty lucky about that because, you know, there's a lot of kids I watched go through that class that there's no fucking way in hell they would choose that. So, you know, but 
you know, they liked, some of them really liked it. Some of them were really good at it. These kids that, you know, I've always been a big advocate and a big preacher of getting this stuff into high schools and getting it, you know, getting it available to high school kids that want to try it, especially now with social media, you know, the convincing to try and get some of these kids to do this or try this is not as hard because they see the, the romanticized glorified version of the industry on TikTok everywhere. And they're like, fuck yeah, I want to go rip engines down. And obviously they have a little bit of a learning curve on what the beginning of the industry actually looks like. But um, I'm hoping between having, you know, trying to get more classes and see more classes into high schools and having classes available to high school kids and then also have that social media to kind of show them like, hey, this isn't some low end, unrespected job. You know, this is a career that is very lucrative and it you can have a job anywhere, anywhere. Like, like Tyler told me when he was convincing me to, to come onto the diesel laptops, they, cause I told, I've told him before, you know, I, I didn't want to leave the industry. I love the industry. I don't want to leave it. I don't want to fall behind. And I love what I do. I. Uh, you know, I, I told him, I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. And he looked at me and he's like, Melissa, you can work for Diesel Laptops for six months, a year, two years, four years, whatever the case may be. And you can go back to John Deere and get a job immediately for good pay. And they would immediately hire you back. It does not, it's, it's okay. Like, it does not matter. I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot then. <laughs> I'll give Diesel Laptops a shot. But he's right. He's right. You know, it, you can find a job anywhere. There is way more job positions available than there are people to fill up. Yeah, and I can't even imagine. I can't, I can't even count how many times I was on the phone with different customers that are offering me jobs over the phone when I was working for Diesel Laptops. It's like, nope, I'm sitting tight. I'm 51 years old. My back is done. I, I, I love talking about it more than doing it now. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I miss it. I miss it. Go going from the uh going going from working ten and a half hour days and then half days on Saturdays even sometimes, which I hated. Uh and you know, working on stuff like your brain's constantly doing things and you're constantly like every machine is a giant puzzle and every machine is a giant problem that you have to solve and you know, there's intricate steps in figuring it out and it's it's it takes so much brain power. Like people think mechanics are stupid, but it takes so much brain power for 10 hours straight a day to do this job. And it was, it's something that I'm very proud of. Manipulating and scheming. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Everybody pictures a mechanic being goober off of Mayberry, but that is so much not the case. It's, uh, oh, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a uh, lot of, a lot of thinking going on. This old brain don't like it, <laughs> but yeah. no, it was fun. Enjoyed being a mechanic. Um, I'd still be doing it, but like I say, my back got to the point. I was taking the cane out on the job site. Some of my, my uh, field service job. I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, it's time to hang her up. <laughs> I've done a lot of dumb things when I was young and uh, it's pain, pain for it today. Yeah. Kids, you know, the old guy that tells you stop jumping off the tracks of the excavator about 800 times. He's right. You should probably listen to him. <laughs> All those safety meetings, you say, ah, don't worry about that. Yeah, worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Take care of yourself, especially if you enjoy it, because it's uh, it'll hurt. But the same token, it was worth it because it was a lot of fun. Been fed my family off of the, the diesel industry my whole career. It's all I really know, sort of farming, and uh, I love it. Yep. And I'm same. hoping my kids love it and take the ball and run with it that I'm teaching. I, I would love to raise little mechanics, but uh, I have to have kids first for that. So ho hopefully, hopefully one day. I'll, well, I didn't think I was going to be a mechanic until I was 17. So give them time. How old are your kids? 25, 17, and 16. Never mind. <laughs> I thought I figured they would be younger. So, uh, welding's a good industry to be in, too. They're actually pretty good at it. In her class she had in high school, she took a welding class, and her uh, her welding beads actually look better than mine. Nice. Fuck yeah. I used to love welding class. That's a really good industry to be in, too. 
all the trades actually are really great to be in right now. Yeah, her boyfriend's going to school for welding, so maybe she'll jump in. Who knows? That's how I. That's that's what made me bite the bullet on going to Wyotech was hanging around my ex at the time and all of my friends and his friends that were working on stuff, and they went to Wyotech too, and it's kind of what sold me on that. So she has hope yet to be a tradeswoman. It's not for everybody though. It's not for everybody. It's hard work, but man, is it rewarding. You know, if you're the type of person that doesn't like sitting down at a computer all day, fucking try the trades, fucking try the trades, because it's worth it. I couldn't work in a factory. I couldn't sit by a computer all day. I tried management, and uh, quite frankly, that was a, a combination of sitting by a computer and getting yelled at all day, and I'll go back to that machine anytime, you know? Yep. Yep. At least you can yell back at the machine without HR involved, right? some bad words and then all of a sudden it decides it's not going to go back together and it's going to fight you the entire time and you're like it's okay maybe i should try nice words now i think all of us as mechanics have been there where we're like should i sweet talk this in the bad way or sweet talk this in the nice way maybe it'll listen if i'm mean to it you'd be sitting there things aren't going together right a job you did a hundred times putting something on and it just won't go and you just step back for a minute and oh um go back and it goes right on there it's always the easy things right it's or not like the relatively easy and relatively simple jobs that end up fucking you like like it's it's never it's never the giant job that you've got to spend 80 hours doing it's always the stupid little shit that should be easy and then there's just one little thing about this job that's not making it fucking easy when yep. I was in field service, I'd be in my service truck, I'd finish something up, and well, I hit this other one up on the way home, that's only going to take me about a half hour. Three hours later, calling your wife, yeah, I'm, uh, this didn't go as planned, I'll be home when I can. <laughs> yep, the whole one broken bolt away from a 30-minute job being a three-day job, sometimes, is uh, not very far from the truth. But, it's, but that's part of the beauty of the industry. Yeah, and, uh, that's why we do. So that's why we make good money. Oh yeah, that you're you're paid very well in this industry for knowing how the fuck to take shit apart, rip shit apart, and put it back together. Putting it back together that's that's the important part. <laughs> that, that's the hard part. Yeah, you can rip anything apart. I can fucking rip anything apart. It's figuring out how to go back together and go back together right. I I have an entire bolt store in my toolbox from that exact thing because I thought I lost something and I go and got a new bolt for it and I put a new bolt in it and then I go to clean up later and there's all my bolts that I thought I was missing and now I have an entire drawer full of them. But at least I replaced them. I didn't keep anything. I was pretty bad good about. <laughs> I'm such a hoarder. I am a hoarder mechanic. I had to control my hoarding at one point in time because I had two five gallon buckets full of bolts and caps and plugs and all kinds of random shit. And I finally had to be like, I'm so tired of every time I want to look for a bolt, I have to dump out both of these fucking buckets and dump them all over the fucking floor and dig through these giant fucking piles. I'm done. So I went and got these like, like this little dividers from snap on that fit in my drawer. And I put those in there and I'm like, okay, Melissa, if it doesn't fit, Need, if they don't fit in these dividers, how you have them all divided, you don't need it. You have, if if you fill this up, you don't need any more. And I've had to stick by that. But I mean, shit, I, I helped set up the tool room in the other shop and one of the shops I worked at in Wyoming. And it was a new shop and I helped set up the tool room. And I, I had spare parts drawer and spare parts drawer turned into like, hose clamps and exhaust clamps drawer and uh, spare seal kit parts drawer and then other random fucking parts. It turned into like three fucking parts drawers. And every single time, you know, you'd rebuild a hydraulic cylinder and you never use all the seals in the kits because they always come with, you know, seals that cover multiple models. So they would all just get thrown into that thing. Well, it's, it's pretty handy when you uh, fuck something up and you need another seal, like uh, hydraulic cylinders have these, uh, the, 
the smaller ones at least are plastic. These little plastic wear rings that go in the side of, inside of them in the center. Them motherfuckers are so easy to break. Like they're stiff as shit and trying to get them wrapped around themselves enough to shove down into the center of this tiny little rod guides pain enough. But the thicker ones will fucking snap. And it's like, it's like borderline's gonna snap before it goes in. And yeah, I've, I've had my ass saved a couple of times because I've had a couple of those in my, my, my wonderful little spare parts drawer that I love so much. I'm a hoarder though. I've got like caps and plugs and <laughs> caps, plugs, and like you say, little seal parts, stuff you know is going to break and the extras and they did come in handy a lot. But I'd keep them in, uh, I was too cheap to buy the snap-on organizers. I just cut off uh, windshield washer solvent jugs and dumped it all into that. Kept it underneath the bench. <laughs> I had a boss, um, a couple of bosses that were very, I'm, I'm not necessarily the cleanest worker. I, I, I will have a fucking tornado in my bay by the time I'm done with something. But my, I've, I've worked for a couple of bosses that were pretty anal about like, neatness and like cleanliness and something that always drove me crazy too is having a bunch of extra shit like in boxes of shit around my toolbox so that's when i finally like you know i moved my bolts into my toolbox i moved my important caps and plugs into a really nice divider i have a video on tiktok which was one of my first videos on tiktok and I have my caps and plugs all nice and organized in my drawer. And I just, I have my camera up and I slowly open it. And like every heavy equipment mechanic on the planet saw that video and they're like, this is mechanic porn. Oh my God, the drawer is beautiful. Cause everything, everything, all my caps and plugs were so, it did not stay this way that long, but <laughs> at the time, all my caps and plugs were perfect and organized and it was so pretty and everybody loved it. But I also had these little like, working boxes that like the little like mill teeth came in and they're like little plastic boxes and i i'm also here's another hoarding thing oh god here, we're gonna get into melissa's hoarding addiction i i have kept every single connector off of all the wiring harnesses i have replaced and john deere has not asked for back i learned this from an old mechanic because they make great test ends and, and test shit or if you know if something's fucked up you've got spares and i have two boxes full of those i kept that kind of stuff definitely because even if you're taking something apart and the, the plastic over years gets brittle and it's good to have those crimp them in there and done so well i loved them like you know there's um like for dozers, for on example, for John Deere dozers, they their uh, motor sensors, their wheel speeds, their motor speed sensors, are way underneath the fucking belly pan of the, these fucking things, where it's covered in dirt, it's fucking packed full of shit, and you got to run tests with it. Well, you have to be in the cab, so like to run these. So what I would do is I I had these two little connectors I cut out of a harness and I wired two other connectors to it and ran it all the way up into the cab. Cause what I was doing is I was trying to do bypasses is what I was trying to do from the, it, I think this was a J actually a J dozer. Cause I was trying to run circuit bypasses from their the piece of shit controller that they had down to the speed sensor. And that was the easiest way to do it. And I, I still have those. I curled them up and kept them because then if I ever need to test a wheel speed sensor on pretty much any dozer, I can plug it in and crawl out from underneath the shit pile of dirt and test it. Or you can jumper them. I fucking love those things. I love those things because... Anything to stay out of the tunnel of... I got claustrophobia a little bit anyway, so dozers always freak me out having to get under them. So it's, anything I could do to keep out from under those buggers, I was happy. I don't blame you, especially it's, well, ev and everything's going to be a face full of dirt, everything. A anything you touch underneath that thing is going to be a face full of dirt and there there's no stopping it. And safety glasses are okay, but it's still just, yep, it gets down into the top. Been there before. 
So with this, the questions that people have with this industry, how do you think, I know I kind of started on this and then I didn't really give you a chance to answer. How, how do you think, um, I get like on these wild rampages and then I get sidetracked about stories and I don't get to talk to mechanics anymore. I don't fucking get to like talk to mechanics anymore. So I end up rambling on my podcast about dumb shit. <laughs> uh, how do we attract more people in this industry? Because it's, you know, for people like me, people say, you're like, oh, Melissa, that doesn't make sense. How, how can you be in this industry? That doesn't make sense. I'm like, actually, if you look into my background, it makes a lot of sense. You know, my dad's a logger. Uh, I grew up around equipment. I grew up around him fixing shit. Exactly, like farm kids. Like that shit makes sense. Like it, these are kids that already know what this entails. So how do we attract kids that don't have a background in this? Because that's that's the fascinating part for me is trying to get kids that don't already have a background in this. Into this industry. What I've had a hard time with, um... The kids in my class, I guess that you know, you, the, an attention grabber is always, you know, that diesel truck that's jacked up with the, you know, they've deleted the emissions, it's blown a bunch of black smoke. That's what they come in talking about, thinking of the industry, and then so basically, just when I talk to kids, they'll ask questions about stuff like that, and so I just go on that with that with them a little bit, and but as far as over that, the attraction, if they don't know anything from. Uh, anything out of the city will say it's kind of hard it's it's really hard because um it's just hard to connect to them without showing something cool in the process like those yeah. big Dodge cummins diesels or whatever i'm feeling personally attacked here <laughs> i have three of those thank you okay <laughs> You can call me some backwoods redneck fucker with some jacked up piece of shit all you want. It's fine. I know. It's it's cool. I'm okay to terms with it. It's fine. My personal vehicle is a 67 Chevy C10 that's got some rust holes in it. And that's what I drive on the day-to-day. -day. So we, I got a POS myself. So. <laughs> They're perfect. You can fucking beat them up and you don't care. It's nice. Parts are cheap. Just keep driving it. Yep. I have an 86 Chevy that... Um, is still in Wyoming that I actually ended up giving to my parents for them to sell, uh, unfortunately, because that thing is like, it's two-tone, but it's two-tone uh, primer gray and rust. And <laughs> I am so scared that if I try and bring it out here to Indiana, it's going to rust to the ground. But that truck is perfect. I mean, it's got 33s that I had to cut the fenders to fit. And... <laughs> complete like you know heater works fucking phenomenal it's got the glass headlights it's a 350 small block so it starts every fucking time fucking love that truck i fucking love that truck i have, i have five trucks and that's the truck i cho chose to daily drive in the winter time i mean five who wants to fucking deal with plugging in a goddamn diesel every single night and then the heaters don't work that great for the first 30 minutes of your drive well, the only reason I don't have a diesel is, quite frankly, I'm a tightwad. You know, my old 283 Chevy runs pretty darn cheap, where diesels and one injector, I don't know what they go for anymore. But when I did own a diesel and had to replace one, it hurt my feelings. It was $350 or so. They're probably jacked way up now, but it's like, no, no, I'm getting going back to the old carburetor. <laughs> it depends on what diesel you have. Um, my 24 valve that I have, my two second gen 24 valves that are not common rail, those are just nozzles so those are like you can get a performance set for 400 450 for all six now you get into the common rail cummins like the third gens and those are the ones that are 350 bucks a piece those are the ones where you start you know you could be looking into almost two grand for a set of performance ejectors for it's fucking ridiculous but I I just I to my trucks because I love them and I don't know what else to do with my money so it's my other vehicle is a 60 62 Willys Jeep so I guess I just like I'm old familiar with the Willys I am familiar with the old Willys those are cool 
my maroon truck that's sitting in my shop right now, which was my daily driver, has a uh, lost a wrist pin bushing and the piston has been free ball in it in my cylinder in number six and has scored the fuck out of it. So that's cool. It ran it though. It ran well enough to, I drove it for three days like that, not knowing what was actually wrong with it, thinking it was like a fuel knock or I, I actually, I knew what it was. It was just, I was actually just praying. It was just a fuel knock. And I'm like, no, it's not, it's not that it's fine. It's not that it's fine. Well, long story short, lesson, the lesson learned kids is don't buy a fucking rebuild kit off of eBay. Buy from Cummins. Buy from Cummins. I was, the the person that was helping me with this insisted that I need, needed mall pistons. Insisted that I needed to buy a kit with mall pistons, which was great. With the exception that every single other part in that fucking rebuild kit I've had issues with. Fucking seals, all the seals were junk in that rebuild kit. I've had to replace almost every single seal with a OEM seal. And it's, it's fucking irritating. Well, yeah, I'm anymore. I go right to the dealer and people said, you can get it cheaper here, there or other And I'm like, I've just had bad luck. I go to OEM with the Chevy. I go to Chevy. Um, my wife's got a Hummer. I go to Chevy, get everything. I, I buy a very, very little aftermarket anymore just because of my luck with it. Oh yeah. I agree. That's what I do. I mean, shit, even like down to simple things, like I was changing a wheel speed sensor on my boyfriend's car and, you know, we ran down to the dealer. The dealer was closed. So we're like, well, we want to get this fixed today. So we ran to O'Reilly's. Put that wheel speed sensor on. Didn't fucking fix it. And I'm like, what the fuck? And we did swap Gnostics, right? The swap Gnostics tactic where you move the sensors and see if the problem follows. Well, the problem followed. So I'm like, what the fuck? I just replaced this brand. And then I'm like... This is Mopar. Mopar does not like aftermarket electronics. So we went to the dealership and we got the action, the, say, the speed sensor, which looks fucking identical to the other one, by the way. Got the speed sensor from Mo from fucking Dodge and put it on in a fixed problem. Yep. yep. I've just got to, my time is worth something. I'll pay a little more extra and just get the OEM and fix it once. That, that's how I am now too. Especially like after that rebuild kit, like issue I had on my maroon truck. I'm so mad about that. That only had 80,000 miles on it and a lost wrist pin bushing. And you know, it's it may, maybe it was a machine shop that pressed them into the pistons. I don't know, but I really doubt it because the machine shop I used was a very high end machine shop that built Cummins engines all the time, which they didn't build it. All they did was, you know, do the machine work and the block and the head work. Uh, I had my exhaust port and polished and I obviously knew valve, you know, valve seals and guides and all that shit put back in it, but everything was decked. Everything was piston matched. They actually took my pistons and asked me which they took my pistons and my ring kits and they matched each cylinder to each one and numbered them for me. So they, they were, yeah, it was a very, I have yeah, so I really struggle to believe that they were the reason why my wrist pin bushing failed, especially after all the other issues I've had with the rest of the rebuild kit. So, but back to our original question. So, how do we get how do we get kids that aren't interested in this? Because actually, my second interview that I did, or the third interview that I did, that's actually coming out tomorrow, was with a kid that. I asked him like, hey man, you know, what, what's your, he just started. He's only, he's got like two years in right now as an apprentice. And I'm like, hey man, like, you know, how'd you get started in this industry? And he's like, you know, I was like, what's your background? He's like, I don't have a background. I just saw this class and it looked fun. How do we get more people to do that? Because we're missing. Dustin it really, because we just, we just talked about Dodges and old Chevys and old Jeeps. The best thing that I do is just talk about the stuff that I enjoy, which is, what we're talking about and, and then relate it to the industry and some of the fun times I've had doing this. And I mean, where else can you fix a truck than go on a test drive, like uh, on a semi truck and problem happens every 20 miles. All right, let's go for a ride, you know, yeah. or tear it apart. And there's nothing, and you know, this, there's nothing to make you feel better than after you work on an engine and diagnose the problem and 
fired up for the first time and, it, and you problem solved, problem fixed, or you brought yep. it back to life, there's no better feeling really. Yeah. Sort of having a baby or something like that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's a reason why mechanics call big projects their babies. <laughs> but when it's done and it's successful. You have a really good feeling, really good. It's very, it's so rewarding. And, you know, I've always tried to like, you know, people are mad at me right now on TikTok because I don't actually work in the industry anymore. But back when I did, I tried to make content all the time about like, you know, what this industry is about. And, you know, I, I did it off the clock. You know, my bosses knew about it, so it was fine. But, you know, I made a video one time that was, I was running an excavator. And I'm like, everybody thinks my favorite part of my job is fixing shit. Nobody is thinking about the fact that you can take this excavator out when you're done with it and dig a giant fucking hole in the yard. That's a fucking, that's the best fucking part, right? I can come out here and fuck shit up in the dirt. Like, fuck yeah, but who doesn't fucking enjoy that? Yeah, no matter what the machine is, you can't fix it until you know how it works or you know how it operates. So part of a mechanic's job is operating it to try to duplicate it in the process instead of spending like an operator 12 hours a day on it, you get to play for, for, with it for a couple hours and then fix it and then go on to a whole new, new fun and exciting machine and figure out how to work that one. And it's, it's fun to operate them, whether it be a dozer or excavator or a semi truck, go do different things and you play with it, then you fix it and then you go on to another one. It's no, there's no boredom whatsoever. Lots of laughs too. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, shops are kind of like a big, unruly family sometimes and it's yeah I, I love the shop atmosphere and you know talk shit give shit fucking laugh at other people's mistakes and then watch them laugh at your mistakes when you make them and life is good but yeah there's a lot of laughs in the shop some of it we probably can't talk about <laughs> but I mean, Tyler told me I was allowed to do this podcast how I wanted to. And I think he's more than aware of what mechanics are. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, he told me I could say fuck, but I'm also not using fuck near as frequently as like, like a comma, like I usually do. So, you know, it's slightly restrained, but you know, that to a bit, but now that I'm teaching school, I find myself blushing whenever I use a bad word. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I need a more offensive word because I just doesn't cut it. <laughs> fuck doesn't cut it anymore. What the farkles and frick? Mr. Schaefer, you're swearing. That's not a swear. <laughs> oh, that's 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 why I was in the back of the shop. Just kidding. Yeah, I was the farthest back you could get. <laughs> Tyler's office is way at one end of the shop, and my bay was at the other end behind me. Behind two walls yet, so he couldn't hear what come out of my mouth most of the time unless he walked back there. And I'm pretty sure he turned right around and went back to his office. Uh, yeah, I think it's all it's kind of bred into us a little bit, but it's kind of the nature of the job. But it's I I love the shop atmosphere, and I think it's a great environment. And I really wish we could figure out how to get more people into it because they they're missing out. You know, it's if you don't want to fucking sit at a desk all day, trust me. Like, you you know, you're sitting at a desk trying to do work and you get like a couple hours in and you're like, oh my fucking God, I can't, I cannot fucking stare at this fucking computer screen any longer. I can't fucking do it. I, I get that with my phone too. It's the same thing with my phone. I can only stare at my fucking phone for so long before I'm like, I can't, I, I gotta do something. And if you're that kind of person... The fucking mechanic industry is for you. Span. So that's why being a diesel mechanic was a good thing because you don't have to concentrate on any one task for too darn long. And No, because your boss has got about 30 jobs in your queue. So you you, <laughs> you can pick. Doing. Hey, can you get this one done before you go home? I don't know yep. which one you want to put it in front of. I'll do whatever, but I'm going home at some point. Right. Yep. I always had about one or two big jobs and then... Oh, uh, four or five smaller ones in my queue. You always had that big one and a few to go along with it to keep it flowing because you're always waiting on parts for one or two. Yep. Especially in 2020. Oh my God. The parts 
waiting was a fucking disaster. It was horrible. Yeah, 2020 was weird. We were out of stock of fucking fuel filters and shit like that. Like, a fuel filters? Really? And of course, as a mechanic, you're like, God damn it, John Deere, what the fuck? Oh my, can't give me my fucking parts. And then you talk to Caterpillar and they're having the same issue and Kamatsu's having the same issue and all the truck dealerships are having the same issue. And you're like, well, that sucks. Looks like we're going to have to wait this one out. Well, when I was at Diesel Laptops, customers would call and they diagnosed um, their, uh, the deaf sending unit, the deaf header being bad. And they're like, look, yep. that, nobody has one. It's a month or two out. This truck's going to be parked. We're making payments on it. Do you know of a workaround I can do temporarily? And um, that was before Cummins and them released to being able to, I don't know, legally delete them until the part came in. And like, nope, I got nothing. So. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't like if you try to delete that out of the system, it's going to not run. It's going to derate. There's no way around that. Yeah. Unless you tune it, obviously, and you delete it and put a delete tune on it. There's really no. I actually had an excavator. You might get a kick out of this. I had an excavator that I worked on at one point in time that was deleted. An excavator. And it wasn't tier, it wasn't, inter, it wasn't final tier four. It was an interim tier four. So it didn't have def on it, but yeah, I thought it was the weirdest fucking thing. Cause the customer didn't tell me, right? I didn't know until I opened the hood of this and everything that's involved on the EGR is unplugged. There's no DPF filter anywhere to be found. And it's literally just a pipe out of his fucking turbo into a stack. That's his exhaust. <laughs> and then he's like, later, he's like, oh, yeah, I deleted it. Isn't it fucking awesome? I'm like, I mean, yeah, it sounds fucking cool. I'll give you that. But um, you realize I can't work on half this shit, right? You realize that, you know, this involves flashing the ECM or doing any kind of tests in the ECM. Like, I'm not going to be able to do a lot of that stuff because I can't get into your ECM because your ECM doesn't. So the first problem we brought it in with was like, you know, we did a fan motor on it. Fuck yeah, I can do fan motors. I can do mechanical shit on that all day long. Fuck yeah, I'll do that. Then it turns into he ha he kept having this um, charge. What was it? It was like turbo outlet temperature too high. And that's not actually a sensor. For that value, it's a calculated, yeah, and it's calculated from multiple sensors, three actually. Guess what? One of those fucking sensors that it calculates from is unfucking plugged. So, how the fuck am I supposed to know? I'm like, he's like, well, it just started doing this. I'm like, well, how the fuck am I supposed to? I, I tested the other sensors. I'm like, this is a calculated measurement. How the fuck, like, am I supposed to be able to diagnose this if I can't? One of them's unplugged, and if I plug it back in, you're a little fucking programming bot, and they're going to freak out. So, um, finally, after, like, a few months of convincing him, because he was mad at us for a while, which, I mean, we still, we worked on his AC, like, I can work on AC. I worked on everything on his machine that wasn't, didn't have to do with the ECM or, you know, electrical on the engine. And finally... He called me up one day and he's like, hey, Melissa, he's like, well, figured out that code. I'm like, did you now? Like, yep. My tuner guy plugged into it and he fixed it. I'm like, hmm, imagine that. So I've been telling you for months. But it's, you know, that's that's the thing with deleting that people don't understand. It's like, it's, it's kind of contradicting because if I owned a pickup truck, I would delete it. If it was out of warranty, there's no fucking way in hell I keep all that junk on there. No fucking way in hell I keep all that junk on there. But from a dealership mechanic standpoint, it it renders a bunch of tools that you have at your disposal useless. You can't contact ETAC because you're not even supposed to have it in the shop, right? So you, you can't contact ETAC. You can't have any kind of dealer's assistance. You can't do anything like that. You can't plug into the ECU. You can't 
look at these things. Like it's one thing if it's just a sensor and you can read the values, kind of figure that out. But when it's something like a calculated measurement that it goes by like a bunch of other sensors that half of which are unplugged for your delete that you did, it's, it ties our hands a lot. And it's frustrating because some customers don't understand that. They're like, well, it's a deer. And then the guy's over there. He's like, I want to trade it in, right? Can I trade it in? I'm like, uh, yeah. If you spend $20,000 on a new filter and you plug all your shit back in and let us reprogram your ECU, then yes, you you can. Yep. Until then you might want, you can sell it on Richie Brothers, but I wouldn't recommend it because this machine's actually a decent machine. It's just deleted. And your guy that did the tune kind of fucked up. And some of them are probably pretty good, but I don't, a majority of them are just, I don't know, half-ass hackers. I don't know. Some of them done some funny things. When I was at yeah. the dealer, I never really ran into it because if it came in and it had been deleted, we wouldn't even touch it for anything. Yeah. We'd say, you're not no, supposed take to. it off. We're not touching it. But when, now at Diesel Laptops, you'd have people calling in, mechanics are working on one that had been deleted. And my whole service manual that I used to help them is just throw it out the window because it's, it's useless. And I said, I'm sorry, just take it back to whoever tuned it and deleted it and have them fix it. Cause there's nothing I can help you with because my, my service manual, the fault codes you're getting, everything it's asking us to do, is not there. So I, I don't even know what to tell you. Well, there's, and it's not, you know, the, the values taken from the engine and some people don't understand this is some of those values and those readings are used by other controllers. You know, like the, how, like excavators, for example, they have an entire system on the excavator that keeps it from stalling if you overdo the hydraulics. And it uses a bunch of information from the ECU to control that. The one thing I noticed that was really weird about this particular machine is it would, the second you started it up, Turbo shh, ramped all the way up, full spool. The, the VGT turbo. It's like, what the fuck? And it stayed like that. Like it would, the second you start it up, it shh, and spool up. It's like, what the hell? But it didn't like the vein. I, I don't know. It was, it was a cool machine. It was fun to dig with. It was really loud, really loud. At one point he wanted a muffler on it. And I'm like, bro. Got bigger problems with the muffler here, but sometimes when you're uh, scraping for work in a new shop, you gotta take what you can get. We worked on that. I that dealership knew how to survive in hard times. They knew how to survive. They would not if it came down to it. Then smaller shops, they weren't turning work down. Didn't matter what it was, they weren't turning work down. They take it in and keep that keep the uh, keep the till filled. You got to, you got to feed ourselves. Well, is there anything that you would like to kind of add to our kind of conversation about, you know, the diesel technician shortage and what we can kind of do to invoke people to try this industry? Because, you know, we're missing out on a bunch of people, you know, including people that aren't even in high school. You know, we're missing out on people that are older too. All I can tell people is it's fed my family for over 30 years. I had a lot of fun. It went fast. It is hard work. You do get dirty, but it's so fun. You really don't care. I mean, it's, it's tons of fun. And, and, um, I've made more money than your average Joe my whole career. So it's great. Jump in, do it to make small investment in tools, but you can choke that down to however you want to do it your personal level. But other than that, it's great. Come on board guys. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, people are that the bringing up the tools thing is is something that somebody has not brought up yet, actually, and you know that's everybody gets scared of it, right? Like, oh my god, it's like a lot of money. It's like, yeah, I I spent probably ten grand my first year. Um, some of it in loans off the bat starting right. out and it's a lot of money starting out and that's the worst part is your first few years after that it's just a tool at a time and merry christmas you don't have to have snap on either you can i mean most of my original set of craftsmen 
that I bought in uh, 1989. Um, I thought, well, when I get more money, I'll just replace that with some snap-ons. You know what? I never did. I still have my very first set of Craftsman tools that my mom and dad bought me starting out back in the 80s. So, yeah, you can. it doesn't take the uh, snap-on or Mac. You don't have to spend all that money. Yep, you got to do what you got to do, you know. I, it's... It's kind of one of those things that like, you know, I, I was a big spender on tools. I, I've got like $115,000 worth of tools. You know, people worry about like, oh, the price of tools, price of tools. And it's like, you don't have to do what I did and rack up a bunch of fucking tool debt your first year. Like you said, you can get cheap stuff or, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that will actually give you tools. You know, there, you know, John Deere's got programs where if you get sponsored by their dealership and go to their school, not only will they pay for your school, but they will also pay for a beginner set of tools. And Harbor Freight has this uh, fellows program too. I'm looking into for my kids where they'll give scholarships. It can be used for tools or other things in regards to starting the careers out. So there's all sorts of programs out there to help a person get started. Mine was mom and dad, but there's other programs. <laughs> hey, my, my three quarter inch drive snap on ratchet that I have is all thanks to my stepdad that happened to find one at an auction and it was rusted and broken. And I brought it to my snap on man. And I said, Hey, I'm going to be straight honest with you on how I got this. <laughs> right? Like it is this warranty. And he's like, well, I I'm only going to warranty the head. I'm like fucking sold. I will buy the bar. I'll give me the longest handle you got. I'm I will buy that. Fuck yeah. I, I got that. So, but I I've, I've always been picky on my tools. I I started out with, you know, working with Harbor Freight tools and Craftsman and Sears and stuff like that. And once I started using there's certain tools, right? It's not all of them. Once I started using Snap-on ratchets, I'd never I'd never buy another ratchet besides Snap-on uh ratcheting wrenches i i have gear wrench i have maco i have cornwell and the best ratcheting wrenches i have are snap on with the exception of you know i've got the maco ones that are really long and are double ended ratcheting i love them fucking things they're not near as fine tooth as the snap ons but for you know i bought them for doing bell housing bolts on transmissions on graders and now i fucking use them for everything i love them snap on angle wrenches are a patented design you cannot get anywhere else and for hydraulics you know it's but you know i have snap on angle wrenches and snap on wrenches up through inch and a quarter and then everything else is pittsburgh everything else uh, every all of my jumbo wrenches are pittsburgh I got a lot of stuff that just says China on it. Yep. Well, you got to kind of know your limits, right? Like having snap-ons nice and all, but do you really need a two inch snap-on angle wrench or a two inch snap-on wrench? No, probably not. My sockets are all kind of mixed and matched. Some, some of my sockets are snap-on. Some of them are the blue power from Cornwall, which is, it's and you know some of them are fucking blue point so i've got a giant fucking mix of sockets and i actually have a set of pittsburgh in there too um but they're like my if i need something to hammer on set all my impact sockets are snap on and mac and one set of cornwall but my other my chrome sockets are mix max or whatever i i actually never bought chrome sockets um i had a set of old craftsman like six points that were chrome that i i rarely used hardly ever touched and finally one day i broke down and bought snap-on's got those like intermediate length chrome sockets that are like they're not deep but they're not shallow and i bought those i fucking love those things a lot of times awesome. the deep ball can't get into everything but the shallow's too shallow <laughs> exactly but yeah, well, is there anything else you want to add to the uh, our conversations or any thoughts or advice for people? Just uh, man, 
jump into the trade. It's fun. Um, biggest advice is whatever you do, just uh, don't get stuck in a factory somewhere. It's boring. Do something fun.